Welcome back to 7 Seconds or More. This is episode 16. As always, I am Peter Howarth, and as usual, I'm here with Duncan Adele. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I uh, enjoyed the draft. I'm ready for Summer League. Hornet Summer League starts tomorrow, so that's what I'll be tuning into. Hey, in Vegas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's always weird how, like, the past couple games, they've there's been, like, a game in San Francisco, Utah, I think L.A. Um, it was the California Classic with all the California teams and the Miami Heat. <laughs> of course. Very confusing. Yeah, so we took we took a week off to sort of let uh everything settle a bit uh, cuz you don't you don't want to record podcasts being like, "Oh, uh I don't know what's going to happen to Kevin Durant and then he's traded the next day." Um hasn't happened. Uh but yeah, we have a lot to talk about. We uh we have not covered what happened with the draft. And then, obviously, free agency and trading. So I think we'll start at the top with some draft thoughts. Any any immediate things that stand out to you about the draft? Yeah, well, I mean, we talked so much about Chet, so I won't talk too much about him. But the surprise was that he didn't go first, and neither did Jabari. It Palo at one. So it was just cool to see Chet in his Summer League debut just go crazy. And although I think he wanted to go to OKC, he seems to like Josh Giddy. They seem to be getting along pretty well. Um, he posted 23 points, seven rebounds, four assists, six blocks, a summer league record, um, including four of six from three, five free throws, a steal, and all of this in 23 minutes. <laughs> so averaging a point a minute, just going absolutely crazy out there. So it's good to see him, uh, starting hot in the NBA. He had the fadeaway going. He had a putback over taco fall last yeah. night. He was, uh, he's really special to watch and, it's funny whenever I watch like Shet, I see him and I'm like, what's the difference between him and like I don't know, like Thon Maker or like Porzingis? Like, what? Why does Chet get it? I say after one summer league game. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I, you gotta watch enough tape. It just seems like Chet has very solid fundamentals. He's clearly had good coaching and he has been working a long time for this. Whether it was at like U17 camps going against guys like Evan Mobley, as we talked about before, or just the way elite high school prospects are nowadays. They're in so many showcases. They'll go to like a Steph Curry camp and a LeBron camp, stuff like that. Um, and he's got a big bag. Um, he was doing some of that Dirk. Like you could tell, like yeah, the one the fundamentals leg. Yep. like you're saying. Yeah, the one leg, he goes for the bump, the contact, right on the bump, turns around and drains it. And I also like how decisive he is on all those threes. You know, he's not like waiting. He doesn't have to be wide open because he's much taller than his opponents a lot of the time. Even if they're like six eight, you know, he's got he's got a lot of height on them. And then he's just finds just enough separation and drains the three. So that was cool to see. There is one more thing I wanted to talk about about Paolo. Uh, now, a lot of people were saying immediately after the pick. That it was an amazing smoke screen by the Magic, how they didn't leak out their pick, and how they, you know, got many people thinking it would be Jabari Smith. But who cares? Um, yeah, they have the first pick. <laughs> like, unless there were reports I didn't see or comments by the Magic's GM, I can't think of his name at the moment, that they were, I don't know, like trying to leverage veiled interests in Jabari into the Rockets, like trading up and giving up a pick or a player or, you know, gaining another asset while still getting the guy you want, like a Jason Tatum sort of situation or mm -hmm. um, Atlanta Hawks with Trey Young. But if not, like, I don't know, have a workout with a guy you want. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just weird. I don't get it. Yeah, it, it makes no sense. Like the smoke and mirrors, it's, it's just, honestly, it was just bad strategy. Like, they didn't pick up an asset and it just have a workout with a guy. Like if yeah. you have the number one pick, just have a workout like the top three or five or however deep that class is. Like don't don't yeah. overthink things. And it's weird they they drafted him without having met him. Like I don't know. I find that odd. That that's weird. And either it's a they found something out about, about Jabari, or maybe just the Jabari practices went bad, the Jabari workouts, and they didn't want him. And then they're like, shit, like we or shoot we thought this was our guy and now he was here and we're not in love with him 
let's take a chance on Paolo instead. That could be the other option because like we're saying, it doesn't make sense. So maybe that's not what they were doing. The whole draft pick workout is a very weird thing. Like Ke- yeah. Kevin Durant worked out for the Portland Trailblazers in 2007. They had the number one pick. And there was their, I was either a GM or the coach at the time said that was the best workout I've ever seen. And then, Didn't pick. and then they picked Greg Oden who had legs that were different heights and he couldn't stay healthy because yeah. you had to take the generational center. That's how it's very traditionally been in NBA drafts. So you always go the big man. That's why you'd pick Hakeem Olajuwon over Michael Jordan in that draft. Again, they mm-hmm. made the right decision. It's why you'd go with Chris Webber over Penny Hardaway. And Chet over Paolo. <laughs> I I I I mean they're both power forwards basically, but they're sure. a little different. Certainly, the six blocks by Chet stands out, and they have they gained up they gained a lot of other depth in that draft. They picked up Jalen and Jalen Williams. Uh, did you see their uh, their photo shoot? They did the Spider Man meme. Yeah, yeah, they did it. Is yeah. is it was very well. One of them was a second round pick, right? The other was a first. Yeah, the one out of. San- Arkansas was a, a second round pick. And then Santa, Arkansas? Santa Clara was a first round pick. I believe so. Yeah. But the second round pick, Jalen, J A Y Lynn, um, he, I really liked watching him in the tournament. I watched one game and, and he was just, just good. That, just smart basketball moves. That's the Arkansas one? I think so. Hold on. Let me, let me find them. But like, I, I know how to spell his name. Uh, yeah, Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, that's the Arkansas one. This a sophomore. This is going to be worse than Nikola Jokic and Nikola Jovic. Yeah, apparently on the Thunder's tweet, it, like one of them is J Dub and one of them is Jalen something. So they they gave him nicknames. They're like, this is going to be confusing. So they they had to give it to him. Yeah, just trade one, honestly. This is, <laughs> but this isn't that similar, but it reminds me of. When uh, the Celtics drafted Jason Tatum and they had Jalen Brown, everyone was trying to come up with like a nickname. The one everyone was pushing was like Fire and Ice. And it it, <laughs> it never stuck. People just called them like the Jays. Yeah, the Jays is it's it's fine. Decent. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that's I, I'm excited to see what OKC does. But you were talking a bit about like in our in our document here, um, the build now, rebuild now versus like like win now versus continue rebuilding. Like where do you think OKC is in that right now? Well, they're in a really unique spot. They are probably the most like NBA 2K rebuild I've ever seen where I've yeah. never seen a team get so gutted and accumulate so many draft picks and vault to the front of the draft. Um, like as like as flawless of a process as it is different than like the 76ers where they were just playing terrible minutes, like 36 minutes a game. Um, you know, they had a lot of young guys. I mean, they, even so they, they almost accumulate too much talent. I mean, Isaiah Roby was waived who, I mean, he's a rotation big, he's young. Yeah. Um, but I, they're going to take this thing slow for, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, Sam Presti, their uh, general manager, he has like the pedigree and reputation around the league that he can get any job he wants, but he has he's been linked to the Celtics, he's been linked to the Knicks, the Lakers, um anyone who has a big time opening. If you want to get the best GM in the league, you'd go get Sam Presti. But he's clearly comfortable in Oklahoma City. He probably really values the autonomy he has in the decision making and that ownership group in Oklahoma has provided him that. And so I think he's pretty fully committed to building a winner in Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, he's in a GM's dream right now. He's got a good young core, and like, how many first round picks every year for the next like five years? Like, I, I don't understand why any GM would want to go anywhere else. Maybe like a GM that wants to win now versus a GM that wants to be known as one of the greatest GMs. I think that's maybe where he's different. Like, he's he's got a chance to be the best GM ever right now, and we'll see if that works for them. But they need to, like, realistically, their window with Chet and Giddy. And I guess SGA doesn't really fit that timeline because their window's what, like five years? Well, it's in funny. Five years? SGA's like 24 or 25, and it's like he doesn't fit the timeline. I mean, I guess he could. Um, but you're going to have a lot of other young stars. Yeah, I mean, they don't need to trade him at the moment. 
Yeah, maybe he brings them to their first uh, conference finals with this squad, and then he gets traded away, and the young guys with the, <laughs> I don't know, picking up a scenario. Uh, but what you were saying earlier about Presti, um, if the the incentive for him to leave would be, like, if you help save, like, the Knicks, if you fix the Knicks and get a championship, you will be the pariah and king of New York forever. Yeah. If you are the savior of the Knicks, that dysfunctional organization, like <laughs> you are a legendary. And, you know, it, it's just different than if you do it in Oklahoma. Yeah, that's true. And it's it's weird, though, because you look at a lot of rosters around the league and you're like, oh, this team has improved. This team has improved. This team has improved. But guess what? There still have to be like the four worst teams in the league. There will be the four worst teams in the league that will tie for the highest lottery odds and will be in the hunt for Victor Wembeyana or Scooter Henderson. Yeah. Hey, the Hornets, they have a chance um, <laughs> with all that's been going down in uh, Buzz City. Uh, in L.A., but yeah. For <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's true, in L.A. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in that contention will be Indiana, uh, San Antonio, uh, who knows what happens with like Houston or Orlando? Um, OKC even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, OKC is. I mean, I'm just circling them because they have a lot of talent, but you don't know if that'll translate into wins immediately. Uh, yeah. Or like Giddy was injured for most of the year, so even though their team was better than their record, they didn't have Giddy, which was part of their success early on. Yeah, I mean, they'll certainly be someone I will want to watch um, moving forward. And that kind of is a great transition into what we are our main topic for today. A couple like teams that we want to watch or we're intrigued by uh, next season. Um, and this isn't necessarily just like, you know, I don't know, the Bucks, the Celtics and the Warriors. Um, we just wanted to pick teams that uh, they'll be fun to watch um, either based off additions that they brought in this offseason or just other other times. So do you want to start off, Duncan? Yeah, I think my the team I'm most excited to watch but also could be the most disappointed by is the Pelicans next year. Because the Pelicans, like, I, I don't know about you, but the Pelicans-Suns games were some of my favorite games to watch in that entire playoffs. And just they have such a good core, and they finally had some spirit, and they had Zion on the bench going crazy. And now Zion is supposedly healthy he signed a supermax for posting uh videos of himself dunking in an empty gym yeah and now he has the opportunity to either make the suns like a top four seed i'm not the suns make the pelicans a top four seeds four seed or just like continue to kind of coast like i I don't know uh I, i really liked how brandon ingram seemed to finally step up and was able to become the number one scoring option on a team and maybe with Zion getting there, it'll take some pressure off of Brandon Ingram and CJ, but also some pressure off of Zion because he's no longer the only scorer. So, and then additionally, like with their rookies too, uh, no, no longer rookies, I guess, but with Jose and Herb Jones, like they're they're fun to watch. They're a good story, even though they got a little Pat Bev like at the end of the series. And I was like, all right, guys, like tone it down. It's getting a little annoying, but I think that's one team I am excited to watch and see where they go next season. I, I think they just have a really good core group that uh, has a really good balance of youth and experience, but it's still all talented throughout between like Valanciunas and McCollum and then mm-hmm. uh, Ingram and Zion uh, on the younger side. Uh, they are a team that if Kevin Durant is moved, they are a real dark horse candidate because what if you just offered Brandon Ingram and a glut of young players and picks. Because, I mean, not that I believe the comparison is that accurate, but Brandon Ingram, just a worse version of Kevin Durant. That's true. Um, so they would be someone I would circle uh, on as a dark horse. I am going to go on the record. I do not think Kevin Durant will get traded. I think this is a little bit of posturing, um, maybe to get Kevin Durant some leverage. Uh, it just... Part of why we were also shocked that Kevin Durant was is like seemingly available is because there's never been a player that would command so much value in a trade due to uh, talent and um, like where he is and in plus. his prime and the contract. 
Yeah, and precedent with Rudy Gobert getting traded and getting offered all that. I saw a funny tweet that was like, oh, the Wolves and Jazz were just in league to make sure KD doesn't get traded. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Danny Ainge. <laughs> Killer Danny. That's what he does. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't think Durant will get traded. Um, but yeah. What do you think about the Westbrook Kyrie trade that could possibly happen? Um, because there's a rumor and now there's been real talks about it. Yeah, well, I think you're more likely to do it if you trade Durant. Because if you keep Durant on your team, you're trying to win. And getting Russell yeah. Westbrook is not conducive to winning unless you bring in a third team. If you bring in like the Spurs or the Pacers, where they get Westbrook and then, um, well, again, I don't know the logistics of it. But and then the Nets end up getting like a role player or two. But yeah. it just it doesn't add up to me. Uh, if you're keeping like Westbrook and Durant at at this point of Westbrook's career, it's not it's not helping your team as, as volatile as Kyrie has and is. Yeah, I saw an interesting trade that you might have seen on Twitter as well, like a five way trade that wouldn't work, but it involved moving Donovan Mitchell. Um, out of Utah as part of this because you know that's another player that has talked about maybe wanting to get traded that could fulfill a lot of draft picks because you can't trade eight first round picks for Kevin Durant it has to be some players like realistically speaking but at the same time I saw a report that the Jazz are trying to build around Donovan Mitchell when I thought they were going to blow the whole thing up um well certainly the the Gobert Mitchell core ran its ran to its end but like, why wouldn't you want to build around a guy who's like 25 and it's a 25 point per point per game score. He's shown great flashes in the playoffs, big performances. Like, yeah, you'd want to, I'd, I'd at least like to get a year or two out of him, see what it is. Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't think he would get moved. If Mitchell gets moved, I would bet he would go to the heat. Gotcha. For a, you know, if they're interested in a Tyler Hero based package, but we don't know if that'll be the case. Yeah. What's one of the teams that you're interested in and uh just keep an eye on? Yeah, so you went with the Pelicans, which were a uh they were a playoff team last year. I'm gonna go the complete opposite, uh, as a team that had the number one pick in last year's draft, the Detroit Pistons. Mm. They were a team that were they really started to figure things out in the second half. A lot of that had to do with the play of Kate Cunningham in the second half of the year. Uh, he kind yeah. of, uh, a lot of rookies tend to do well in the second half of their rookie campaign. Well, either they, either they start to figure things out and they click or they start to sort of die off because they've never played a season that long and grinding. I mean, it's a lot longer than a college season. Oh yeah, but they were really a talented group already. That uh, and they added two lottery guys in Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran, that are both really high energy, instant impact rotation guys. Um, I'm just really intrigued by their starting five. I mean, if if they trot out Cade, Ivey, Sadiq Bay, Marvin Bagley, and then I don't, I I wasn't, I couldn't really figure out if they would start Duran or Stewart. Um, I presume they would start Stewart, who's been a very solid starter for them. And then, you know, figure out Duran as he goes. But um, uh, they were heavily rumored to be in the mix for DeAndre Ayton as we try to figure out what happens with him. I mean, he's still the the biggest fish in the sea at the moment. He's just the big the big star in free agency. He was just without a home at the moment. Yeah. Um, but when they brought in Duran and then they did a sign and trade well, not a sign of trade. It was uh, the salary dump by the Knicks where they bring in Alec Burks and New Orleans Noel. It seemingly takes them out of the uh, the eight market, but uh, it's a point that Bill Simmons makes a lot. Uh, what, like If you look at the teams that have made the finals or have been successful in the past five to seven years, almost none of them have spent big money on the center position. Um, so I thought it was smart to sort of save money by getting these centers in like the mid lot or the mid first round late lottery, having that, that cheap rookie scale contract um, and, and allocating all your money elsewhere. I mean, if you look, go past the, the last couple of finals 
and the finals winners, like the Warriors, Looney, not a big money guy, the Celtics mm-hmm. with Rob Williams, he's on a like 15 mil or less, so cheap. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Heat with Bam, he would be one of the more expensive ones. He might have still been on his rookie deal then. Anthony Davis oh, is more of a power yeah. forward. Um, True. So, yeah, you just don't see a lot of precedent anymore with the way the league has changed. Um, and so I think it was a sort of savvy move by Detroit. Again, we'll see how it pans out. I think Aiton is still like an underrated player and asset. Yeah, no, he definitely should be on a team. Like, it's kind of weird that like a top 50 player um, hasn't been signed because he's a top 50 player in the league right now. 100%, no doubt. And he's a free agent. But I, I'm interested to see, like, the Hornets are in a weird spot because they are they withdrew their qualifying offer for Miles. So that's going to be some salary that's freed up. Um, but are they in, the, like, a win-now position with Aiton? Well, not really. I was just thinking there could be a weird, like, three-teamer between the Hornets, the Pacers, and the Suns where yeah. Aiton goes to the Hornets. Um, uh, Tur- or Miles Turner goes to the Suns. Um, I don't know what the Pacers end up getting. Again, I would have to fully hash that out. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Charlotte is an interesting one. We're, we're not going to bring them up because they're more interesting to see what happens than I think to watch with the yeah. Miles Bridges sized hole in their roster. Yeah. I, but no, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And yeah, that'd be a good thing because they've also spent a lot of draft stock in centers recently. Um, yes, Mark Williams. Getting Mark Williams and Kai Jones' development. He's been looking crazy in all of his like off-season workouts, so I really hope he li- lights it up in the um, summer league and at least gets a chance on the roster. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see with all of that, but DeAndre Ayton has to go somewhere at the end of the day, <laughs> whether he's going to take a pay cut to play like on a shorter deal or just like keep holding out until he gets his money. We'll see. I don't know. Everyone looks good in the in the workouts. And the Instagram workouts, like I see James yeah. Booknight post them all the time, and I'm like, Booknight, you're not that good. <laughs> I, I support yeah. Booknight, but like these, every player does it. Yeah, well, Kai Jones looked really good in his in the G League stuff, but then again, the G League, like, not always an indication of success. Um, but another team I'm interested in watching are the Hawks. Uh, they kind of got like the Dejounte Murray trade. Um, that's interesting. Like finally having Trey with a another guard and like a defensive minded guard. So kind of hopefully we'll patch some holes in Trey's defense and make them not rely on him as much and give him more room on offense as well. Um, Cause Trey was getting targeted a little bit uh, sometimes in the playoffs and play in and all that. And then no more Kevin Herter, right? He went to Sacramento. Correct. Yeah. So that opens up some spots for the other players, like such as DeAndre Hunter. He w- he was doing pretty well at the end of the season. Um, did pretty well against the Hornets in that playing game. <laughs> yeah. But then, uh, finally, like for uh, all of the Husky fans, the Hawks drafted Tyrese Martin in the second round. Kind of a defensive-minded wing who improved in, in his three-point shooting throughout his career at UConn. So I'm interested t- to watch the Hawks for Trey and DeJounte, but also to see if Tyrese gets any playing time on that team. The Hawks are a really interesting one. Will John Collins get moved? He's been seemingly available for like the last like three years. Uh, yeah. And then Hunter, he was, he's been very inconsistently hurt for the past couple seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's shown like really good flashes and spurts over, over like multi-game stretches, but it hasn't like translated fully and, Remember, he was the number four pick a couple of years ago. So yeah. the the pedigree is there. And then they have Bogdan Bogdanovich, who will be yeah, in true. a bigger role with Herder out of the way. Uh, but this is a wrinkle I saw people talk about. If they didn't, or if they like waited a day or two with DeJounte, not that you regret getting DeJounte Mary. He's like 26 years old, all-star, great two-way guy. Mm-hmm. Could the Hawks have been in on Kevin Durant? Because that's a lot of picks that they could have sent his yeah. way. I think Durant in that Hawks jersey would look great. <laughs> I feel like he'd like Atlanta. I don't know. He, yeah. he seems to like I mean, Brooklyn. He, so That's true. Not that could they're similar there. cities at all. Yeah, they're big cities. He likes the, the big city market. Yep. Um, 
but no, that that is interesting. I don't know if he would have wound up there. It's but just a what it if. It would have been cool with him and Trey, yeah. And Also, um, John Collins, when I, I was looking him up uh, a little while earlier, and do you know what his nickname is? John Collins? Isn't yeah. he like John the Baptist? Yeah, the Duncan De- the Duncan Deacon. <laughs> I was like, oh, I looked it up. Like, why is he John the Baptist? Apparently just like it's some summer league game or something. He heard someone say, that man's John the Baptist out there. And he's like, I like that nickname and like self-proclaimed it. <laughs> I like the self-proclaimed nicknames. They, they're they yeah. way better. I'll, <laughs> well, if they're good, like when, when yeah. a player, I don't know, like Grant Williams, like call me Batman. Like, no, bro, you're not going to call Batman. <laughs> he's Robin. Um, but I also hate when players don't like the nicknames when they're good. Like like the Slim Reaper, right? Yeah, I don't think he likes that. And then Rob Williams, for a time, didn't like Time Lord. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. And I, I don't remember if Rudy Gobert likes the Stifle Tower or not. How can you not? He doesn't not? get a choice. That one's just too good, yeah. No, the Stifle Tower? I, yeah. That's a, Can't go wrong that's a goaded that nickname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i'm excited to see what the hawks do because they they're also that kind of team that just needs to get in the playoffs you know they could be a seven or eight seed and if they're in they could very well be any team in a seven game stretch like we saw two years ago yeah we saw it i mean it's a bit of a fluky run for them two years ago mm-hmm. and they were very much underperformed last year they were just kind of sluggish all year there wasn't a lot going on outside of trey but yeah, they do have all the makings of being a team that um, would you know hopefully be a top six team in the East, so you avoid the play-in. But yeah. that should be able to potentially win a first round series. Yeah, and I also think the NBA is ready to expand because it seems like like every team is like a one player away from being like a top eight, top six team. There's a lot of talent in the league. Um, yeah. Vegas and Seattle seem like the two home runs. And I think it would be great for the league. And so if you're in Vegas and Seattle, those both have to be in the West, clearly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Move the Pelicans to the East? Pelicans and Grizzlies would make sense. Yeah. Although balance-wise, adding two expansion teams to the West and moving out two of the top like eight teams in the West to the East, um, you know, that's a bit tricky. So yeah. like, do the Bulls go to the West or something? I don't know. Yeah, that'd be weird. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. What other teams are you excited for? Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go curveball out of left field. Uh, the Sacramento Kings. I know who thought oh. they would be on this list. Not me. Um, <laughs> and the the Kings very much were doing their Kings ways. Um, because like on paper, some of their stuff was very suspect. Like they took Keegan Murray at number four when it very much seemed like Jaden Ivey was the like clear guy at number four and that they could have Mm -hmm. gotten some value, but clearly Detroit didn't think so. Detroit thought Sacramento would take Ivy. So they Mm -hmm. just kind of gave up on getting him. They didn't, I don't know if they had talks and the compensation was too much, but they just sort of wrote it off. And, you know, Sacramento might've not wanted to trade back beyond one pick because they really wanted Keegan Murray. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And also, they Dante DiVincenzo, who they acquired at last year's trade deadline, they let him walk in free agency to the Warriors, and they instead went with signing Malik Monk and then trading for Kevin Herter. So, all they're, I mean, they're different players, all three of them, but they're all sort of fit the mold of a, well, Herter and DiVincenzo more so than Monk, of a 3 and D wing uh like great three point shooters. So again, questionable on paper that you just let that DiVincenzo asset walk while trading a first round pick and and two contracts for Herder. Yeah, I mean the Kings roster, like it kind of like it makes it seems ready. You have De'Aaron Fox, who's a great point guard when he wants to be. You've got the big guy in Sabonis. And then you have those three players you just mentioned there. That's like a solid starting five. Maybe not a playoff starting five, but maybe not like bottom of the league starting five, um, dependent on De'Aaron Fox kind of. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of wrinkles in that whole thing. A lot of 
things because Keegan Murray, while people were not like hating on Keegan Murray, but wondering why Ivy wasn't the guy taken, he's been awesome. Other than one dud the other day in his debut in the summer league, he had 26 points, eight rebounds on 10 of 14 shooting and four of five yeah. from three. And then last night, he had 24 points, seven rebounds, three steals on nine of 16 shooting. No one's talked about that. <laughs> no, they talked about the debut, but last night's disappeared under the Chet, uh, all the Chet stuff. Yeah. And like, here's the thing that doesn't make sense to me. Like in a league where like wing versatility and, and shooting around stars is so, so valuable. Like you look at whatever the, like the Lakers or the Bucks, for instance, let's just like ju- juxtapose them. The Bucks. They have figured out that they have to put shooting around Giannis. Like Middleton's a mm-hmm. great shooter. Holiday's a capable shooter. And then they have guys like Grayson Allen, Wesley Matthews. They, got, they just got jingles. Yeah, the bigs that can space the the floor as well. Brooke Lopez and Lopez Bob. And yep. Bob. And then like the Lakers, they really struggled with their shooting. Like like obviously like Dwight Howard, um, mm-hmm. uh, Russell Westbrook, not great shooters around LeBron and Anthony Davis. Look, if the Bo- is bonus, he he's like an okay shooter. De'Aaron Fox has regressed a lot, and he has a very... I don't have the percentages in front of me. But if you have your starting five around the two of them being Kevin Herter, Harrison Barnes, and Keegan Murray, mm-hmm. that's a lot of shooting. And then you have Davion Mitchell, Malik Monk, Rashawn Holmes off the bench. It poses to be a decent eight eight-man rotation there. Yeah. By the way, he did twenty nine percent, twenty nine point seven percent from three last season. Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> uh, four seasons ago, he was at thirty seven percent. Like he's capable. He just has to get back into it. Yeah, he, he's regressed. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, what's interesting about uh, Sabonis, at least, is when he was in Indiana, he was very much in a minutes timeshare between power forward and center, uh, because. When Miles Turner was in the lineup, he'd play power forward. When Turner was on the bench, he'd play like a smaller center. Mm-hmm. But in his short, like half season stint last year in Sacramento after the trade deadline, he spent 80% of his minutes at center. So it's clear he's the center, Rashawn Holmes, a backup center. Mm-hmm. And so that should provide them with a lot more spacing. Um, yeah. That being said, like the West is really deep. So they're not a lock to be even a top eight team but it yeah. should be the most competitive team of the De'Aaron Fox era. Yeah. I mean, I mean, no. let's just go through the West. Like, like, <laughs> like who is better than Sacramento? Phoenix, Golden Phoenix. State, Dallas, New Orleans, Clippers, Nuggets, uh, probably the... Jazz? No. Well, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I guess so. Maybe not without Rudy. Um, uh, Trailblazers. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I said the Lakers. Probably the Lakers. Um, well, there's eight. And yeah, and, and you know, the Thunder. Who knows? The Thunder, Rockets, Spurs. Probably all of them know. And then I don't think the Jazz would be. Um, that is twelve. But still, that brings them up to like what eleven. <laughs> I think there's like two teams. I'm. Oh, Memphis. Yeah, not better. No. I think I'm missing one team, but anyways, maybe the Nuggets or the Timberwolves. Oh, Timberwolves! I forgot. Timberwolves would be better than them too. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. They might be like the tenth or eleventh best team in the West. It's really yeah. tough. Um, but I think these moves are. I don't. I guess they're underrated. I don't. I just the lineup is is not like bad. It, it's it has promise. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm interested to see all that. And kind of thinking with the Pistons too in the East, like the East is has really big talent, but for some reason I guess they're not as deep as the West, even though I think they have better like top end teams, and like the the seven the eight nine ten seed in the East have much better records in the West, but like the Pistons probably better than the Magic. Uh, be than the I, I don't know. I mean, I like Franz Wagner and Fultz. And and Anthony and and Wendell, they have some more win now, guys. 
Uh, That's true. Well, the difference here between like the Pistons and the Kings is the Pistons will have no expectations this year. That's Whereas fair. the Kings traded away Halliburton. They took Murray over Ivy. Um, yeah. They they clearly, they've chose De'Aaron Fox over multiple other guys. That yeah. There's pressure on these guys that you were chosen. Sabonis, you were brought in. Yeah. No, it, it's interesting. I think that the NBA will look very good with two more teams, but... I wonder how that'll that'll make the playoffs even harder to get into. <laughs> well, yeah, there'll be there'll be more competitive teams, yeah, even with the plan. And I don't think it'll be overly diluted because there are like talented players who, I mean, maybe they're just not good enough, but they could use another chance on like another team. Um, the the player for some reason that's sticking out to me is. Tremont Waters. He was a second round pick of the Celtics a couple years ago. He was really good in the G League and had some okay stretches in the NBA. But with how many great point guards there are all the time, if you're five ten, it's really hard to stand out unless you're really good. So like, yeah, um, that's true. Th- those teams could really start taking like swings on guys. I don't know. It's it's just fun to have more competition and and more franchises around. Yeah, no, it'll be fun for like, like trading and stuff. Also, if they do this, I don't know how the expansion teams work in the NBA, but if it's like the NHL and other leagues where there's like a draft and they like draft players from other teams. Yeah, it would be a, uh, so each team would be able to protect X amount of players. And so, yeah, you could, yeah. So I don't know if let's say you're the Hornets, you don't protect. PJ. No, no, PJ would be protected. I don't know. Cody Martin, who you just resigned. And then boom. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Yeah, you probably get to protect like what, four players, five players? Yeah, I, I it's definitely probably four, so it's not your starting lineup, so it's a little more interesting. It's definitely in the rule book somewhere, but I don't rem- and then each team can only have one player taken from them. Gotcha. So you can't just pick like three warriors or something. Um yeah, but, that makes sense. but do you want to wrap us up with uh your last team? Yeah, of course. So the last team I'm looking at is the Clippers with their uh, acquisition of John Wall. Really interesting because, you know, in the NBA, we talk a lot about like big threes um, for whatever reason. And then this would kind of give them one with Kawhi, PG, and John Wall. However, there's a big asterisk on this because there's there's many, many asterisks. (laughs) Yeah, healthy Kawhi, healthy PG, and healthy John Wall. We could be looking at like another Lakers, you know, where the team is good in a 2K simulation and looks really good, but then they they have to play on the court to make it into the playoffs. That's what the Lakers ran into, is they'd lost, let so many regular season games slide that they couldn't even get into the play-in at that point. So Kawhi, right now, he hasn't done any full five-on-fives, but is getting there. Apparently, the Clippers have been very relaxed with his recovery, um, allowing him to take as much time as he needs um, but they said that mentally in his recovery, he's doing very well. So whatever that means, he might be on for October. Um, and they also have some other depth, you know, with the Latvian laser, of Luke Kennard. <laughs> so, yeah, he's like the best two-point shooter, I think, last year in percentage. Yeah. Um, Rocco, Terrence Mann, Zubac, Norman Powell, and Paul George had a pretty decent season. His splits were 24.3 points. Uh, almost seven rebounds, six assists, and two point two steals. Um, he's Paul George, a very impactful player. Even though sometimes he's playoff P, <laughs> um, I think that you know that's like kind of a misnomer, and it's just been like some weird situations for him. So it'll be interesting to see how he does with Kawhi back. Maybe putting him a lot more at the two, even though instead of him playing kind of like the two three that he was doing, and then John Wall at point guard. Um, but the way the positioning works with all of this, like you have John Wall at the one, Paul George at the two, Kawhi at the three, and then I guess probably like Marcus Morris or yeah, Covington, and then, and then, and then Zubac. Zubac. Yeah, but I mean off I the bench, it, Powell and Kennard yeah. and Man, it's very it's good a great depth. Bench. Yeah, and then the other thing is Reggie for some Jackson reason, too. Reggie Jackson, yeah. Roko, I don't think he started a game for the Clippers last season. 
Uh, I was looking at like the the average starting lineups, and like he didn't start very many games. So I, it seems like he might be a kind of player who does better off the bench. Um, but yeah, the kind of dependent on John Wall. <laughs> he the last time he played, he played forty games in twenty 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 one. He averaged twenty one points, three point two rebounds, seven assists, one point one steals, point eight blocks, three and a half turnovers. Which you know, it's not huge, but it's not a low amount. He has the ball in his hands all the time, so. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but that was 40 games like a year ago. Uh, he ruptured his Achilles after, like, at home in a home accident or something like that. And for those who aren't familiar with his injuries, before that, he had a left heel that needed surgery. And during surgery, it got infected. So he just has had no luck with his health. I wouldn't say it's his fault. It's very much like, like, rupturing your Achilles at home and then getting an infected surgery, like not, I think it's just bad luck. So he needs to stay healthy for the Clippers to be able to get like that good seed in in the very competitive West and be able to compete. But what do you think of the Clippers? Well, while he hasn't played basketball in years, so I I think that means he's really fresh um, and his explosiveness is better or he doesn't know how to play basketball anymore. I don't know. Uh, the Clippers have been the sexy pick for the last like two or three years ever since the Kawhi era got started because it makes sense. I mean, they have a duo of two of the best two-way players in basketball and Kawhi and Paul George. Kawhi is a proven winner. Paul George, I believe, in 2017, he was either second or third in MVP voting. Just yeah. fantastic year with Oklahoma City. Um, I think Paul George gets um, a little too much flack sometimes because I think he is way better off being the second option. I don't think he's a number one option guy. I don't think you can win a championship than him being the number one option. I agree. But yes, with the Clippers, they, they have the right combination that they've sort of been missing for a while. They have like actual depth, a lot of NBA tested talent that, that knows their roles. Um, even if some of the personalities between a lot of those guys might fluctuate between uh, like Morris and um, like John Wall or Reggie Jackson. Yeah. Um, But yeah, they have the makings of a team that could be a top four seed in the West and make a deep playoff run. Um, And I just think the NBA is better when uh, Kawhi is in it just as a two way uh, like veteran presence. Um, And I I think the, we sort of missed him last couple of years. We've forgotten about Kawhi's like dominance and greatness. So it'll be great seeing him back on the floor. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Uh, I think they they should be a good team, but it it'll depend on injury. If they can stay healthy, like I think they'll have a good spot in the playoffs. Kind of like the Bulls, you know, where they're a good team when they were healthy, they were winning games, but the playoffs and winning games and staying healthy, like it's not always super indicative. So I hope they don't wind up having a bulls esque season where they're the best team in the league for a week and then kind of fall off. But I think they could sustain it a little longer and make a playoff run. The bulls are a weird one too. Cause I don't know like how far you can go with a team led by Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan. Even if I like Lonzo ball and Alex Caruso and Patrick Williams and some of their, and yeah. ancillary pieces favorite word ancillary <laughs> um, yeah yeah but uh i think we're gonna wrap it up here uh but first we will read last week's q a and poll uh last week's well i guess two weeks ago last episode's poll again if you want to vote or and have your answers shared out uh you can listen to us on spotify if you click the episode and scroll down in the description i believe it's only in the app you will see the Q&A and poll, and you can answer there. Um, if you don't listen to us on Spotify, uh, good for you. Uh, <laughs> so the poll question was, uh, who is the best player outside of the consensus top three? Uh, this was for the NBA draft outside of the consensus top three of Paolo Banquero, Chet Holmgren, and Jabari Smith Jr. Uh, so number one was Jaden Ivey. Makes sense. Um, number two was Shaden Sharp. Very interesting. I think, yeah. so I guess we are betting on the talent and that he'll um, figure things out. Although he is a really weird fit next to, well, not necessarily next to Dame, but just in Portland. 
if they're trying yeah. to be win now around Dame and he's more of a project. So maybe he's more yeah. of a trade asset. I don't know. Yeah, so um, unless you have anything else, um, any last free agency linking thoughts, Duncan? Yeah, well, I'm excited to see where Aiton goes. Excited to see Kevin Durant stay in Brooklyn. And I, I don't know, yeah. Excited for the rest of the season, and then football's coming up. <laughs> football's coming soon. Uh, yeah. Yes, things are heating up, um, even if things are kind of winding down in the NBA at the moment. So yeah, keep an eye out. We may be coming with uh, some new formats of shows coming up, maybe like more themed episodes. So yeah, um, so subscribe to us if you haven't done that. Um, you can hit the notification bell if you want to get a notification whenever we drop a new episode because we kind of don't have a schedule. So it's actually very helpful. <laughs> um, and you know, if wherever you're rating us, rate us five stars if you like us. If you don't, you just don't have to rate us. You know, that's <laughs> you, no negative feedback. No, just yeah, just feedback. leave your thoughts to yourself. You know, if you lie to if, us, if please. you have nothing good to say, then don't say anything at all. Yeah. We might have a mailbag episode soon too, right? I, I hope so. If there's enough submissions, uh, again, yeah. you can just like DM us on Instagram or TikTok or do the mailbag button in the link in the description. All of that, again, available at the link at the description of this and all episodes. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you, Duncan, for coming on. Thanks for having me as always. And we will see you next time.